Welcome to our webinar today. Thank you for joining me. Today, I'll show you how to be a better negotiator so you can save money and reduce your risk when negotiating a commercial real estate lease for your business. And what you'll learn today will apply to any type of commercial space, such as a retail or restaurant space, an office, or even warehouse space. No matter what type of business you are in, if you're thinking about leasing space or need to negotiate a lease renewal, or make changes to your lease, such as an assignment or a sublease, a need to reduce the rent, or even terminate the lease, you will walk away from the session today with information you can use immediately. So let's get started. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you how you can reach me with any questions or if you want to know more. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Peter Morris. I've been in commercial real estate for 34 years now and have dealt with real estate all across the USA and Canada. I've also worked in countries such as Indonesia, Colombia, Kuwait, China, Taiwan, Mexico, and more, just to name a few. I've leased over 5 million square feet of space personally and administered to thousands of leases for some of the biggest brand names in the world. I'm honored to be credentialed as a real estate expert, coach, and trainer. While I'll repeat this at the end of the session, I want to make sure that any questions that come up will get answered. So let me give you my email and telephone number. The email is pdmorris at greensteadcg.com. That's p-d-m-o-r-r-i-s at g-r-e-e-n-s-t-e-a-d-c-g dot com. Please take a minute to write that down. P.D. Morris at greensteadcg.com. And my direct phone number is 250-893-8230. I'm available weekdays between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Pacific time zone. Now, I don't want to alarm you, but we have to call this out. When you negotiate your lease with the landlord, you're at a disadvantage. You're at a disadvantage because the landlord leases all the time and you do not. Leasing is the landlord's business. For you, leasing space is something you need to do in order to do your business. Even if the landlord says they have a standard lease they want you to sign, they also have room to negotiate. The problem you have is that you don't know what is open for negotiation, and the landlord isn't going to tell you either. So let me tell you. Almost everything is up for negotiation. You just need to know what it is, what you can ask for, and how to phrase it. Let me give you an example from my workshopping coaching. Let's assume that you're entering into a five-year lease. That lease starts October 1st. When do you think the landlord wants it to end? That's right. He wants it to end at the end of September, five years from now. Now, that's very straightforward. Okay, so now let's assume you're a retailer that is entering into that lease to start October the 1st. 25% of your annual sales will typically occur in November and December, as shown in this graph. If your lease expires at the end of September, you will miss those key selling months. Now the landlord has negotiating leverage when it comes time to renew the lease because they know you want to have those sales. But there's no rule or law that says the lease must be in equal years. So I'd coach you to negotiate a lease that is five years and three months long to end at the end of December, just before you head into the time of negative cash, cash flow during January to March. Now look at what has happened. Aside from getting those sales, you have the negotiating leverage when it comes time to renew because the landlord knows that if you don't renew, it will be difficult for them to release the space until spring. Get that? So having that type of specialized knowledge levels the negotiating playing field, and we'll give you some of that today. Oh, I almost forgot. I hear some business owners tell me that they rely on the landlord's leasing agent to help them. Well, here's the problem with that. Well, actually, there are two problems with that. The first is you need to know that in many cases, the agent is paid a commission based upon how much rent they'll negotiate. The second is that in both Canada and the USA, and in fact, many other countries, have a rule called the law of agency that leasing agents must follow. 
Now, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not going to give you any legal advice, but when I got my real estate license, I had to learn all about agency. Essentially, what agency means is that the landlord's leasing representative is acting as an agent for the landlord and is required to do their best for the landlord. In short, they can't help and look after the interests of you, the tenant. So again, it's really, really important that you have the special lease negotiating knowledge to look after your interests so that you can save money and reduce risk. And here's the thing. Once you learn and overcome the disadvantage, you turn it to your advantage and the possibilities are tremendous. So now let's look at what we can expect today. You will learn five essential negotiating elements that are required for a successful lease negotiation and five common negotiating errors that even professional leasing agents make when negotiating. If you don't know these, you will be leaving the entire negotiating process to chance. That's just not acceptable because the space you rent could well be the single largest expense you have in business. The value of your lease over a five or ten year period can amount to thousands or hundreds of thousands or in some cases even millions of dollars. Again, not knowing how to negotiate will cost you money and increase your risks. So before we start learning about these 10 things I mentioned, we should probably frame it all in a great leasing process. It has 11 steps. It starts with your business plan and your marketing plan, and you'll see why in just a minute. From there, you need to look at your business needs based upon that plan. This helps determine the criteria you will use to judge space and the negotiation. From there, you'll want to perform a location analysis. And let me be the first to tell you, you know, you know the phrase about the three most important things about real estate are location, location, and location. Well, that is absolutely wrong. Why? Well, because it doesn't tell you anything. What makes a good location? It is different for different types of space, such as retail, office, or warehouse, as well as different types of business. If you sell coffee like Starbucks or donuts, you want your location to be on the side of the street where most of the morning traffic is headed into work. On the other hand, if you sell fried chicken, you want to be on the side of the street where most of the traffic is going home so it's convenient to grab a big bucket for your family dinner as you leave work. Once you know the type of location, you can now take stock of the vacant inventory that fits. And you'll want to do a bit of research on who the landlord is. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to lease space from someone I couldn't get along with for the next 5, 10, or 15 years. Then arrange to see the spaces and really look at the spaces comparing each to your criteria. And now the negotiating begins. I always suggest that you conduct two negotiations on your top two locations at the same time. This gives you negotiating leverage in case one deal starts to fall apart. Just make sure you don't sign binding agreements on both locations. Once the negotiation is done, it's time to commit the transaction to paper. Generally, the landlord will prepare the lease and give it to you for signature. At this point, it is really, really important that you take that document to a lawyer who is a specialist in commercial leases. My research indicates that only half of business owners have the lease reviewed by a lawyer. That is a mistake. It should always be reviewed by a lawyer. But there are two things I counsel my clients about. The first is to make sure that the lawyer is a specialist in commercial leases. While they may cost a bit more on a per hour basis, they can save you money in the long run because they know commercial lease law. Secondly, don't let your lawyer start the negotiations over again. There may be things that need further clarification and legal wording that can be tweaked, but the lawyer shouldn't attempt to renegotiate business terms such as the rent. The landlord will take a very dim view of that tactic. Once the lease is signed, then comes the preparation of the space, and finally, you get to move in. Does all this make sense? I hope so. So, let's go over the five essentials in negotiating the lease. The first one is aspiration. Now, before you think this is a no-brainer, let me explain. Studies of negotiators in all types of industries have conclusively shown that those with higher aspirations going into the negotiation typically have better outcome, even against someone with more negotiating skills. Aspiration is not only a state of mind, 
It's also defining your ideal outcome in the negotiation. Don't forget that in negotiation, there is compromise. There's an old negotiating saying that if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. Also remember that you don't know what the landlord will give on or how much room the landlord has in their position. Plus, they won't tell you unless you ask. It's critical that you decide before you start the negotiation that your ideal position is going to be such and such on an issue that's going to be negotiated. And then write down all of those ideal positions. Obviously, you don't want to just hand that to the landlord, however. On the other hand, there is a negotiating technique called the open kimono. Using this technique, the negotiator places all their cards on the table saying, this is what I need in order to do a deal. This can be a very dangerous technique if not done completely correctly. My friend Howard Klein used to be the in-house lease negotiator for a national brand name. After the basic business terms were agreed, the landlord would prepare the document and Howard would send it back with all of his comments. All 29 to 35 pages of changes. He would mark up almost every single page in the lease. That was his aspirational position. This is actually quite a common practice, but you need to know what to change, how to change it, and how the landlord will react before doing something like that. These are business decisions, not legal ones, so it's important that the changes reflect your aspirations for the deal. That last point about knowing how the landlord's going to react is important as well. I recall a time when I was negotiating on behalf of a landlord and I was working with a tenant who wanted to lease about a thousand square feet. We had agreed to all the business terms and I sent him the lease. I was told someone was going to be calling me to negotiate the lease wording. It was his lawyer. His lawyer's very first comment to me was, the landlord's lease is draconian and I'm advising my client not to sign it. Well, I told him that when his client, the prospective tenant, had $75 million to buy the property, he could write whatever type of lease he wanted and hung up. I then immediately called the tenant and explained what happened. Now the tenant who thought he had a location and really wanted that location was on the defensive. The next day the signed lease arrived on my desk by courier without one word changed. His lawyer cost him all negotiating power. Here's an important thing to remember about aspiration. The landlord may have their own aspirations. It's very common that when dealing with an independent tenant, the landlord will say something like, here's our standard lease, please sign here. They'll make it sound as though there's no room for negotiating, but you need to remember that the landlord's standard lease is their aspirational position. That's their starting point in the negotiation. Now, by the way, although I've been talking about the lease document negotiation, the negotiations start long before you receive a lease. The places to save money are in the key business terms, and the place to reduce risk is in the lease document. Okay, so now on to the second essential element. The second is criteria. This is the opposite of aspiration. The criteria you create are the requirements you must have in order to complete the deal. Think of it as your bottom line position. How do you determine your criteria? Well, they come from your original business plan, the needs of your business, and your space needs. You see, it's much more than just how much rent you're willing to pay. The criteria needs to look at all aspects of the location, space, and the actual transaction that you're going to be negotiating. You must determine the space size and layout. Your rent tolerance based upon a sound business plan. And here's an error that I see all too often. Many times a business owner will ask the landlord, how much is the rent? And then go back to their office and rework the business plan to justify the rent. Well, that's a fool's game. What happens if the revised sales projections just don't happen? The business fails. The rent should fit the business plan, not the other way around. Make sense? Now let's look at how the rent is structured. Different types of property and different landlords all have various rent structures. While you can't convince a landlord who charges what is known as a net rent structure to provide you with a gross rent structure, your criteria should spell out your bottom line negotiating points. 
Let me give you an example. In a net rent structure, the tenant pays a basic rent as well as a portion of the overall operating costs for the property. And while you know what the basic rent will be over the length of the lease, you won't know how much that contribution to operating costs will be from one year to the next unless you set criteria to do so and determine that it is important to your overall negotiation. By the way, my coaching clients receive a proprietary list of 42 deductions and exclusions to the landlord's operating costs that should be negotiated into the lease. We created this list from thousands of leases we've administered to over the years and represents some of the best negotiations done by some of the world's leading brands. This list can actually save you thousands of dollars over the life of your lease, and that is just in one area of the lease. Inducements. The criteria needs to outline the type of inducement you need and the amount. An inducement is the industry term for a type of a bonus, which you get for signing the lease. Think of it in terms of the product commercial that blares out, but wait, there's more. Now, if you don't always get an inducement from the landlord, but this is where aspiration and criteria play hand in hand. Here's a hint. Ever notice in those TV commercials, they tell you the price they want before offering the bonus. Well, that's how you should negotiate inducements as well. First, negotiate your best basic rent, then ask for the inducement. There are a lot of different tactics to negotiating inducements, but that's the first thing I do. Let's talk about risk tolerance now. Remember that a lot of the lease is about sharing risk. Well, that isn't really true. In the lease the landlord provides you, you will probably assume most of the business risk. That is their aspirational position. Little risk for the landlord and a lot of risk for you. Almost all the negotiation around the lease document is about moving that risk back to the landlord and having them assume some of your risk. And what do I mean by risk? Well, ask yourself these questions. What happens if a catastrophe happens, such as a flood or a fire? Can I get out of the lease if I can't operate in the property? Or what happens if the nature of the property changes? Will it affect my business and what can I do about it? Get the picture? I could go on and on about this, but we have a lot of information to cover, so I just want to touch on the concept today. So how much risk are you willing to assume? How will you protect yourself in these events? What will be your bottom line? In some cases, you might not get all that you want in the ebb and flow of negotiation. So you have to carefully think about how much risk you want to take on at the maximum and in what areas of the lease. Finally, you need to determine your timing. Think back to the graph on how long the lease term can be so it starts before you go into your best selling period. Also think about the 11 steps in the leasing process. If you're crunched for time to be in the space the landlord has the negotiating upper hand, if not, you're in a much better position. Okay, so we're halfway through our list of essentials and look at how much great insider information you've already gained. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, as they say. We haven't even sat down at the negotiating table yet. Listing your aspirations and criteria occur before the negotiation. So now, let's sit down at that negotiating table. Number three is creating a positive experience for both you and the landlord or their agent. I can't stress how important this is. Here's an interesting fact. Psychologically, people remember events and feelings for a longer time than they remember facts and figures. The same is true in negotiating. Both you and the landlord will remember how you felt the negotiation went long after you've forgotten even the financial details. You'll be working with your landlord for a very long time, five to 20 years or maybe even more. They will remember the experience of the negotiation during that entire time. If you need something from your landlord during that time, you'll want them to be on your side. I once worked with a client that has a business that is over 300 years old. If they had a bad experience with someone, they never did business with them again. And in this case, never is at least 300 years. Your initial, very first lease negotiation with a landlord not only sets up the relationship during the term, but also impacts the negotiations for the renewals. But here's a more pressing reason to create a positive negotiating environment. 
If you're at odds with the landlord, they'll dig in their heels and it'll be harder to negotiate with them and get the concessions and the lease you want. Let me be clear on one point though. A positive experience doesn't mean you give away your deal aspirations or criteria to please someone. It is the way in which the negotiation occurs. I'm known in the leasing business as being firm but fair in my dealings. That is what I coach as well. And here's a final point about experience. There is no such thing as a win-win outcome in a negotiation. I believe this to my core 100%. Now hear me out before you say, well, that's not what everybody else says. If both sides have their ideal position and the result of negotiation is compromise, neither side can say that they won. Both sides of the table have had to give some things up in order to get a deal done. An agreement won't be reached until each side feels they can accept the amount of risk and the exchange of value in the transaction. A true win-win negotiation occurs when both parties feel good about the negotiation. So the win-win isn't really the outcome. The win-win occurs during the negotiation. It is the experience. The fourth essential to a successful negotiation is the trading of value. At its simplest form, you get space in exchange for your rent. Basically, you must value the space more than the money you're paying the landlord. In the actual negotiation process, it's more complicated than that. It starts with the very first meeting with the landlord or their agent. You should always have two objectives. The first is to find as much information as you can about the landlord and the property. You do this through a series of questions. You want to learn what the landlord holds is valuable beyond the rent that you'll be paying them. Secondly, you want to show them that leasing to you, and if possible only to you, will they get that value and more. In our coaching, we go into a lot of detail on things such as the differences between price and cost, value benefits, etc. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do all of that today, but the idea I want you to grasp is to position your business as valuable to the landlord. This makes them want you more, and you gain negotiating power as a result. Now, as the negotiation goes on, there are different types of value being traded. There's the monetary value of the space, and then there's the trading of risk. So, here are three strategies to employ. Quid pro quo. It's a Latin word. It means that you get something if I get something. If the landlord wants something, you must always ask for something in exchange. For example, let's say the landlord got the last say on the amount of basic rent you'd pay. Immediately following would be a great time to introduce the idea of an incentive. See how that works? Of course, how you phrase it makes all the difference in the world. Another way to trade value is to look at alternatives. This is true horse trading because you'll counter the landlord's position with an alternative. The easiest example is if the landlord says the rent is $30 per square foot and you provide an alternative of $25 per square foot. Although there are different alternatives for different parts of the lease and even for specific lease clauses. The last one we're going to talk about today is seek options. This is different than looking for an alternative because you are not going to suggest an option. Your job is only to suggest to the landlord that they may have an alternative to their original position and ask them what it might be. If done correctly, you can get the landlord negotiating against themselves. This is ideal. Do you recall I said you don't know how much room the landlord has to give on any point and they're not going to tell you? Well, they won't tell you unless you ask if they could suggest an option. When they offer an option, you now have a sense of where they stand and you can either accept that or continue to negotiate on that point. The last essential element is classic leverage. The person with more leverage has the negotiating strength, period. That's why you should negotiate on more than one location at a time and why you want to continue to reinforce your value to the landlord throughout the entire negotiating process. I've also shown you up to now insider tips to gain and keep negotiating power or leverage, such as my example of getting the landlord to negotiate against themselves rather than you. Now, let me give you two more, but I'm going to warn you, these are hardcore negotiating strategies. 
Use these when you are at the bottom end of your criteria. The first is the use of the positive no. What is a positive no? Well, it certainly isn't saying the answer is positively no. But there will be times when you must simply say no to something the landlord is proposing. A positive no is more about the way you state it. If it is hard-nosed, the experience diminishes. There are a lot of ways you can give a positive no. Two of my favorites are to first say that you're unable to provide or do something because of such and such. Then I add either an alternative or an option and continue the negotiation. So it may sound something like this. I know you want $30 per square foot in rent. However, if I pay that as I start my business, I'm concerned my cash flow won't cover it while we become established. So I can't afford that kind of rent now. Well, that's the first part. And then I add either, perhaps there's another way to structure the rent. Do you have any ideas? That's an option. Or I'd say, I suggest that we start the rent at $25 and move it to the $30 you're asking. That's an alternative. Everybody knows what improv acting is, right? That's where there's no script and the actors just go with what's being said. There's a hard and fast rule to improv. No matter what the previous person says, does, or asks, your response can never be no. Once someone says no, the energy is taken out of the skit because there's nowhere to go. There is no alternative. The same goes for negotiating. If you can, try to leave room for some form of negotiating after drawing a line in the sand. But there may be times when you can't, and no is no. If you feel that the negotiation has come to a stalemate, it is sometimes best to just stop the negotiating and walk away. Bear in mind that if you intend to stop the negotiation, you are potentially ending it completely and for good. That's another reason to have two locations under negotiation at a time. Many times I've found that when someone is at a point when they are thinking of walking away, that person has lost leverage and can't find a negotiating point. On the rare occasion, I've also seen either the landlord or the tenant or both have unrealistic expectations that simply cannot be met. In other words, they had aspirations, but no criteria. However, there is a correct and an incorrect way to end the negotiating. The preferred way is to stop the negotiation, explain the points that were a problem, and use the option strategy we talked about to invite the landlord to connect with you soon if they see some way of resolving the problems. By inviting the landlord to call you, you're making them chase you, and this allows you to gain back the leverage. So those are the five essentials you need to be in place for a successful negotiation. Aspiration, which is your best case outcome. Criteria, which are the minimum requirements that you need for a particular space. And don't forget, both of these are done even before you sit down to negotiate a lease. And then create a positive experience. Use value to keep the negotiating power and carefully use leverage. For the next few minutes, I want to change things up and give you five negotiating errors that even the most seasoned lease negotiator can make. I know your time is important, so we're not going to spend much time on these as we did on the others, but I want you to go away without making these mistakes as well. And I should let you know that we cataloged far more than these five errors, but with the amount of time remaining, I wanted to specifically talk briefly about these. And they are in no particular order. Speaking before listening. You know the saying that you were born with two ears and only one mouth, so use them that way? Really listening to what the landlord says will give you clues that you can use when offering alternatives. Also, if you speak and interrupt, the landlord may offer you something more than you were going to suggest. I'd like to tell you a personal story. I actually grew up in the commercial real estate business. My father was in the business as well and was a shopping center landlord. One day it came time to renew the lease of the one and only major department store in the shopping center. If this department store left, well, my father might as well have turned off the lights and locked the doors to the rest of the property because the department store was the major traffic draw and he knew he needed them to stay to continue to have a successful shopping center. I should also let you know, this was back in the day, when you could negotiate with the actual owner of the department store. 
So the owner walks into my father's office. He was a very friendly and outgoing person that just about everybody of importance in the city knew. After a pleasant greeting and some chit-chat, my father asked, you know why we're meeting, right? For the next 30 minutes, my father listened without saying a word as the department store owner talked. He talked, and he talked about his store. He talked about his plans to add more departments, and he talked about his accomplishments. He finally finished by saying, so we can't continue. While my father was about to interject in an attempt to convince the department store to stay when the owner said, we can't continue to stay here for another 10 years if the rent is any more than X. Well, here's the kicker. The rent the department store owner just quoted was significantly above what was acceptable to the landlord. Making assumptions. Making an assumption is one of the worst mistakes. Assumptions can be made for many reasons, but one of the most common is relying on common sense. By common sense, I mean thinking that because something is done one way in one place, it holds true everywhere. Let me tell you, I've worked all around the globe and I can say there is nothing common about commercial real estate in other countries, other cities, or even in two buildings side by side. Don't assume, always ask is one of my mantras. Considering the lease is fixed in time at the time of the negotiation. The lease is what is known as an executory contract. That means that unlike another type of transaction that is over and done with immediately or over a short time, the lease is constantly being fulfilled over the term, even if that term is 5 or 25 years. If you negotiate based only on what is in place today, you may have significant problems later on if things change. Let me go back to the story I just gave you. Now, imagine if you were a small tenant in my father's shopping center and the department store did leave. What would you do then? Things will change over the term of the lease, like laws, regulations, and competition. You need to anticipate which changes will hurt you, which will hurt you the most, and negotiate to protect yourself. If you agree to change something in the lease, look to see what impact that can have in other parts of the lease. You may need or want to go back and change something else in the lease as a result. I've seen both tenants and landlords quickly go out of business simply because they didn't cross-check something in the lease. I suggested that even before you negotiate, you write down both your best outcome and your must-have criteria. Think of those two at opposite ends of a very long stick. What's in between? Negotiating is all about compromise, give and take. Have you ever bought a used car? The person selling the car gives you a price. You counter with the price you'd really like to pay. They counter somewhere lower than their original, but higher than half the difference between their price and your first offer. And then you do the same and eventually you reach a price. It's somewhat the same in commercial real estate leasing, but it is important to map out what those counterpoints will be before the negotiation and either put that into your criteria or keep it in a separate place. Personally, I've had a book of my step downs for over 25 years now, although now it's on my computer. There are several step downs to my original position for almost every clause in the lease. Does this give me leverage? Of course, because I'm not attempting to think of what I may offer on the fly, in the middle of a negotiation. When I see a position that has been accepted that isn't in my book, I add it in, and then I may use that in my next negotiation. Too many times I've seen entrepreneurs have only one position, and if that is countered by the landlord, they accept it, not knowing what else they could have negotiated. So, have you learned something of value today? I truly hope so, because I'm passionate about helping small business negotiate better real estate leases for themselves. That's why we coach small business using techniques and insider information gained from leasing over 5 million square feet of space. The landlord leases all the time. For you, the lease is only part of your business, but it may be one of the most expensive and high-risk parts of your business. Many landlords have large real estate departments that do nothing but negotiate leases. The people we work with do not, and without our help, many would be at a terrible disadvantage. Simply put, the landlord may be counting on you not knowing even what you've learned today, 
but I have to say there's a lot more knowledge specific to leasing commercial real estate that I simply haven't had time to share with you in this presentation. So if you have a question from this presentation, would like to know more, or you want us to help you, email or call me. I never charge for getting to know people or hear their challenges about leasing, so don't be shy about connecting with me. I would like to coach everyone who connects with me, but I only have limited spaces each month. So if you want to learn about our coaching, if you are about to lease, are going to renew a lease, you need to make a change to your lease or resolve an issue, or you want to learn how to manage an existing lease better, please don't wait to contact me. Take down my email address right now because a question may pop into your head in an hour or a day from now, and I'd love to hear from you. My email is pdmorris at greensteadcg.com. That's pdmorris at greensteadcg.com. Or you can call me directly any weekday between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Pacific Time Zone at 250-893-8230. I'd welcome the opportunity to help you. And if you think the information in this presentation would be of help to somebody else that you know, please share it with them. Thank you for joining me, and don't forget to email me.